All right. Let's start with um, a word of prayer real quick before we go into worship. Um, yeah. Um, dear God, just thank you um, for this Sunday morning um, that we're able to um, celebrate our country and um, also just be able to just now do church and um, find time to um, see your people again and to um, hear from you and to know what you have um, and your words and season for us. So I just pray that even as we worship, um, that you begin to um, move in this place in um, in our hearts, that we uh, will be able to focus and um, discern what, what you're speaking to us today. Yeah, so in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Cool. So for our first song, um, it's a new song. Um, it's called um, Nothing Else. Actually, I think, did Matthew lead it last time? Yeah. So Matthew might have led it before. Um, uh, but it's not exactly um, very relevant to the um, sermon. But I just think that um, it's really talking about um, coming to God and asking for forgiveness. And I think it's really important that we start, you know, with just the relationship saying that, God, I want nothing else but you. So this is just for worship. And I think that um yeah even as we sing this song and if you're you're uh, are just listening just focus on the lyrics it's really really meaningful all right so let's start um do you have the slides up is it up um hansen are we okay all righty to sit here at your feet caught up in this holy moment you never want to leave oh I'm not here for blessings Jesus Jesus you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do I just want you I'm sorry that I've just gone through the motions I'm sorry that I sang another song Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. Caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. Caught up in this holy moment. Never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessings, 
Jesus, Jesus, you don't owe me anything, more than anything that you can do. I just want you. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else to do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else to do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else to do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else to do. Caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet and call a peace holy moment. Never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe me. Anything more than anything that you can do, I just want you. Lovely. Um, our next song um, is a really familiar song. Um, it's uh, I Surrender by Hillsong, and um, so. Um, I think that this song is so meaningful. Um, obviously, it's talking about surrendering, but I think that it ties in really well with today's message. Um, it's about the parable um, of the talents. Uh, and it's just talking about um, when you go into a season of testing, you know, are you going to surrender um, what you uh, are given? And are you going to steward it um, for the glory of God? You know, or are you going to, be like the, the servant of one talent and are you going to waste your opportunity but we really want to be surrendering to God's will for our life and for what plans he has so um, yeah um, this song you guys should be familiar with um, yeah so I'll just play through alrighty <laughs> I 
surrender. I surrender. I want to know you more. I want to know you more. I surrender. Oh, I surrender. I want to know you more. I want to know you Like a rushing, Jesus breathed with him. Lord, have your way, Lord, have your way in me. Like a mighty storm, stir within my soul. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way in me. Like a rushing wind, Jesus breathes with him. Lord, have your way, Lord, have your way in me. Like a mighty storm. Stay within my soul, Lord, have your way, Lord, have your way in me. I surrender, I surrender, I want to know you. I want to know you. I surrender. I surrender. I want to I want to Right. And our last song is also a new song. Um, it's called Arms Open Wide by um, Hillsong Worship. <clears throat> and uh, I think this song is really meaningful. It just speaks about um, in the verses, laying your life down, um, giving God, you know, your hands and your heart and asking him to use it. And just standing with your arms open and surrendering as well. Um, and the bridge. My whole life is yours. I give it all. Surrender to your name. Forever I will pray and have your way. So I think it's just a really, really meaningful song. And I just hope that you're um, really focused on what, what, what we're singing. You know, I don't sing because, you know, just because uh, you have to. But, yeah. Here I stand, I'm open to my 
Ik kan het ook niet zeggen. Dear God, just thank you for this time of worship um, that we're able just to um, praise you and also just to come and say that we want more of you and that we want to um, give our lives to you and for you to um, have your plan uh, and for us to just follow it. And I just pray that, um, yeah, even now as we move into a time of um, giving and a time of um, listening and a time of discussion, just praying that um, we really just do it because um, we love you and that um, you deserve it and that we not do anything of selfish ambition, God. So just, uh, yeah, thank you again for uh, this uh, uh, wonderful Sunday that we will do this. Um, yeah, so in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, now, the, uh, Hanson, we'll do that song after the, uh, after the sermon. So now um, we are going to go into uh, the slides for the offering, and then we're just gonna go into our time of giving. Thank you. 
All right, Ethan, over to you. Okay, can everyone hear me? Okay, hello, welcome back to you service, Zoom edition, and happy National Day. Yeah, I'm wearing red. Um, so even though we can't, even though you service is happening at the same time as National Day, um, if you can, you can probably catch the jets flying past, or the helicopters flying past outside your window, if you have a window. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, hope you guys are doing well and are staying safe, whether you are alone in your micro DCGs or whether you are alone or with your micro DCGs, thank you for taking the time to join this summer fellowship. And now the announcements. First off, if you are in your micro DCGs, please remember to keep it at a maximum of five people, not including the leader. So if your micro DCG is coming to your house, only five people can come. Next, a reminder to save the dates for Youth Camp. Youth Camp is set to happen from 13th to 17th December. So save the dates and stay tuned for more details. Next, there will be a free lecture hosted on the 10th of August by the Biblical Graduate School of Theology and the Faraday Institute of Science and Religion on the topic of science and Christianity. There are also other dates for the lectures, however, they will be paid. More details and the link to sign up can be found in your weekly. And finally, the announcement many of us have been waiting for. Youth service is going to be starting physical services again. That's right, your years do not deceive you. Physical youth service is back. Services will have a cap of 50 people and the live stream service will air alongside it. However, services will be different from how you remember them. For one, services will be shifted to Saturday instead of Sunday. And then there's the question on timing. There are two possible time slots. An afternoon slot from 1.30 to 3 and a, and a night slot from 8 to 9.30. And we want to hear from you. Which time slot would you prefer? Click on the link in your weekly and cast your vote now. And remember, your vote counts. And now moving on to today's sermon. Today's sermon will be delivered by, by Pastor Gabriel and will be a continuation of last, last week's sermon. Pastor Gabriel, please. Thank you, Ethan. All right, just give me a moment as I set up my slides. Yeah, happy National Day, everyone. I hope uh, some of you uh, during the service managed to catch a glimpse of uh, airplanes flying uh, from your window. I managed to see six planes flying uh, across my window while, during worship earlier. Well, we have finally come to the last sermon in this whole entire series on Avengers Infinity Walk. Now, I hope that this series has really been beneficial to all of you as we look at the different aspects of our walk with God. Let me just run you through uh, what we have covered so far in this series. Well, we begin in April, where we look at Nebula and Captain America. Right, Nebula showed us that a Christian walk with God is about putting this old sinful self to death and walking in newness of life. Right, New Nebula and not old nebula. That's what we want in our Christian walk with God. And then Captain America showed us that our walk with God is really about living by grace. That living that grace-empowered life depending on God's grace each and every moment of our life. That is the super soldier serum. Right? Without, it, grace is, without grace, we are weak, but with God's grace, we are strong. And then we took a break in this series, came back to it in July. That's when we look at Iron Man and Spider-Man. Iron Man showed us that the Christian walk is about a life of sacrifice. Right? It's that self-sacrificial living for the sake of others. That's what Jesus himself did. And Jesus also gave an example for us to follow. And then uh, last week, or two weeks, okay, two weeks ago, right, we looked at Spider-Man. Okay, and Spider-Man uh, was that example of how uh, the Christian walk is about entering into our calling. And to enter in our calling, sometimes we have to embrace those out of comfort zone moments in our life. We have to put ourselves in places where we are uncomfortable. But those are the moments that can mold and shape us into who God wants us to be. So once again, I will encourage you, um, 
anytime to go and rewatch all these sermons. The recordings are available on the Carmel Youth, Carmel Youth YouTube channel. So visit it, uh, get some hits on, on the YouTube channel and yeah, go back to, it, to, to these sermons anytime you like. Today, we're going to look at the last Avenger, finally in this series, and that is uh, Black Panther. But since it's National Day today, I'm not going to talk so much about Black Panther that you see right at the back here, or the little figure at the back. But I'm, I'm rather going to talk about Black Panther's nation. And that's the nation of Wakanda. Okay, Wakanda. Well, where exactly is Wakanda? There's this video that is uh, floating around the internet, which I watched, of this student who did this class presentation of this country, Wakanda. And he actually managed to fool his unacquainted teacher, who obviously didn't watch the Marvel movies, into thinking that Wakanda is a real nation found in Africa. How that happens when you, you don't really know the geography of Africa. But for the record, Wakanda is not a real nation. Okay? It's a fictional nation that's only found in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And today we're going to look at this nation of Wakanda. We're going to zoom in on Wakanda as a nation itself. And I'd like to leave us with just two interpretations of uh, what Wakanda can mean for Christian. Okay? The first interpretation uh, is how Wakanda is a picture of the church. Okay, I'd like to I'm show us how Wakanda is a picture of the church and also the mission of the church. And then we're going to take it to a more personal level. Uh, the second interpretation of Wakanda as a lesson okay, on how we can use our talents. How we can use our talents. Okay, so without further ado, let me just begin. Uh, let us commit this time to God in prayer. Let us pray together. Father God, I thank you for this day that we can celebrate uh, our nation's birthday. Thank you for bringing Singapore all the way through 55 years uh, of national uh, history to where we are today. And we're grateful to you that we can worship you today, even though we are in different venues, that we are one in spirit. And as we listen to your sermon today, Lord, I pray, O oh God, that your holy words will convict our hearts of your truth that we may walk in them, that we may obey them for Jesus' sake. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to begin with the story of Wakanda. So right now I'm going to invite Daniel to play us our first clip that will tell us about the origin of Wakanda. Daniel, please. So in the Marvel Universe, right, quite unlike the real world that we see around us, the most technologically advanced nation on Earth is found in Africa. Okay, it's not in the United States, it's not in China or even Singapore, but it's in Africa. It's Wakanda, Africa. Right? And Wakanda is the most technologically advanced nation on the entire Earth because it's blessed with the natural resource called vibranium. Okay? Vibranium, vibranium is not only the strongest matter on Earth in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, it's what Captain America's shield is made of. Okay? But vibranium can also release a huge amount of energy that can power up the whole nation of Wakanda. It enables Wakanda to become that high-tech nation that it is okay, in, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. All because it has that natural resource called vibranium. So in our next clip, uh, we're going to pay a visit to Wakanda itself and I'm going to invite Daniel to play us another clip and let's take a look, let's take a virtual tour to Wakanda of how it looks like in the Black Panther movie. Well, on the surface and to the rest of the world, Wakanda looks like just any typical African nation that you see in the world today. Right? A landscape of grasslands, people who are riding horses, uh, people who are shepherds, right, working in just agriculture. But beneath this third world veneer, Wakanda conceals itself. It conceals itself perfectly to keep its power of vibranium a secret to the rest of the world. And this is how the real Wakanda 
looks like. But beneath this consumment that is probably created by Vibranium as well, Wakanda is this country of sophisticated skyscrapers, flying aircrafts, the most advanced technology in the world. Its appearance and the truth of its power is, like what the movie says, hidden from plain sight. And that's the story of how Wakanda became the best kept secret in the world. Now, the problem with Wakanda, I believe it's not with its wealth or its technological power. You know, there's nothing wrong being that powerful, wealthy nation. But I think the problem with Wakanda lies in this statement that the origin video made. As Wakanda thrived, the world around it descended further into chaos. As Wakanda was thriving, was doing so well, right? the world around it was descending into chaos. The problem with Wakanda is not that it was technologically advanced, but the problem with Wakanda was that it had the resources to do something to help and benefit the rest of the world. But instead, it chose to keep this resource a secret. It chose to hide its capabilities from plain sight so that only Wakanda benefited and no one else. And here's where I'd like to draw my first link uh, to the first interpretation of Wakanda to the church. Right, to the church. Now, do you know that in the Bible, the church is also called a nation. Okay, so each of us actually belong to two nations. We belong to maybe a nation of Singapore, secular nation, and we belong to a spiritual nation. Right? This is what it says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 of the church. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Now, the church is God's nation, and it has a purpose, and that purpose is, according to the verse, to declare the praises of God. Right now, this word declare in the NIV, if you look at other translations in the Bible, such as the ESV or the NASB, it's translated as proclaim. Okay, the King James Bible translates this word declare as the word show forth. So this word actually gives an idea and it is that it's not just something that is supposed to be confined to that personal or private sphere. Right? The praises of God is not something that is supposed to be just hidden, confined to the private sphere. But it's meant to, to be proclaimed. It's meant to go out. It's meant to sh show forth. Right? We ought to declare the praises of God who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's about the praises of God going public, right? the outward orientation for others to see that God is praised. So to give that illustration, the idea of, of this declaring of praises here and found in this verse is, is something like someone shouting the praises of God okay, on the rooftop where everyone can see. Like shouting praise for all to see in public rather than the image of praising God quietly, privately, in your own room. Although in COVID, we probably can't do that, right? But that, that's what it means to declare the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into His wonderful light. And that's what God's holy nation is called to do. That's what the church is called to do. That's the church mission. To give glory to God, to bring praise to God, to show the whole world who He is and how good He is. And so I'm, I'm sure many of us are familiar with the Great Commission. That's the last words of Jesus Christ to his church. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. The church is called to go. The church is called to tell the world about the good news of Jesus Christ, to tell the world the secret to salvation, the secret to joy, the secret to peace. We ought to go and tell the world that cure to anxiety, the cure to meaninglessness, the cure to hopelessness. That's what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. That's found in the gospel. 
I'm not sure how many of you actually notice what gospel means, but the word gospel actually means good news. But the gospel is meant to be good news for a broken world. It's not meant to be a condemnation, right? It's meant to be good. And it's good news for a broken world. Something like vibranium, right? If you, if you could use that as, a, as an analogy. But so often, the church becomes like Wakanda. Okay, like how vibranium is kept within Wakanda. The church keeps the gospel as the best kept secret of the world within the church. Right? So that, that's my first interpretation of Wakanda I'd like to leave all of us this morning. Wakanda is like this church that hides the gospel within its four walls. Right? It keeps the world's best secret within the four walls. And it's not using its God-given resources to go, in, go out to benefit the whole world. The gospel is being kept within the church rather than fulfilling the purpose it's meant to, to, to do, which is to go out um, for the whole world. First Peter says, God has called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. But today, there's still many people who are out there groping in the dark, walking in that darkness. They do not yet have a taste of what it means to be in God's wonderful light. So just last week, I read this national report. That's a Singapore national report, okay? That the number of suicides among those that are in their 20s is at its highest right now. Number of suicides, highest this year. And that number actually went up by 10% okay, from the year before. There are a total of 94 people between the age of 10 and 29 that killed themselves, took their own lives last year. Suicide, not COVID, not cancer, is the leading cause of death among young people in Singapore. Suicide, people taking their own lives, youths taking their own lives. These are people who need to hear the gospel. And if you could just take a walk around the neighborhood estates in Singapore, you probably see this as a common sight, right? If you if you take time to notice, you see some elderly folks who are just doing the back breaking work of collecting cardboards for a living. I've actually spoke to some of them, and all they earn is ten cents, okay, for an exchange of one kg of cardboard. So can you imagine one kg of cardboard gives you just 10 cents? And some of them are struggling with poverty. Some of them are struggling with loneliness. Some of them are struggling with despair. And that probably doesn't fit the side of Singapore that we want to see, right? That glamorous national image today as we celebrate National Day. But, but this is a Singap side of Singapore that actually exists in our society. There are people among us who are poor. There are people among us who are lonely, who are marginalized. And these are people who need the gospel. And having wrestled with all these issues for some time, you know, I arrived with this I arrived at this conclusion. Okay? And this conclusion is this. With how much that we, the church, have been blessed, with all the spiritual and the physical resources that God has blessed the church with, I believe it is our responsibility okay, as the church to take the life-changing gospel to them. But oftentimes, we look at society's problems and we say, nah, no, it's the, it's the government's problem. It's the government's responsibility. But what if, okay, what if it's according to God's word that God has meant for this broken world that we see around us to be the church's responsibility? It is our responsibility to go to them as God's holy nation. We are the ones who are given the light. We are the ones who are called to go to those who are in the dark, to give them a glimpse of what it means to be living in the light. With great blessings comes that great responsibility. The church is given great blessings, but it comes with a great responsibility. We cannot but do something about what God has given us. I know that's modified from Spider-Man, 
from Uncle Ben, but that's true, right? That's true as well uh, for the church. You're not supposed to keep that solution to society's problems, all of society problems, which is sin, okay, uh, deriving from sin. We're not supposed to keep this that solution away from the world. Right? But we're supposed to go out and reach people with the gospel. To reach people with the gospel and to reach people who need the gospel. With that great blessing comes great responsibility. Now if I can use an example. Imagine if we are the nation okay, that has found that cure to COVID-19. But instead of sharing that cure with other nations that are likewise infected by COVID-19, we keep that cure to ourselves just for our own benefit, to benefit our own people. All while the rest of the world is devastated by a pandemic. And that's actually what it looks like when the church doesn't go out to share the gospel with those who are outside of the church. Right? Like Wakanda, we are blessed with vibranium. Blessed with vibranium, we are blessed with the gospel, right? It's our obligation, it's our responsibility to go and share the benefits of the gospel blessing for the good of others. So that is my first interpretation of Wakanda. Right? Wakanda is a church, right? But the world's best secret, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is not meant to be hidden or kept within its walls. But as God's holy nation, the church is responsible for using that great blessings bestowed upon them to reach out and to benefit the rest of the outside world. So I'm done with my first interpretation. I'd like to now move on to my second interpretation of Wakanda. And this will be a more personal one. And that's the interpretation of Wakanda as a lesson on how we can use our talents. Okay? Wakanda as a lesson on how to use our talents. Now we talk about how Wakanda is a picture of the church and that hides the gospel from the rest of the world. But Wakanda can also be a picture of a person that hides his talent from the rest of the world as well. A picture of a person who hides his or her talent from the rest of the world. And so Jesus actually once told a parable known as the parable of the talents to his disciples. And I'm going to switch gears for a moment. We're going to zoom into this parable found in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. I'd like to just point out three things about using our talents okay, from this parable and we're done for today's sermon. Right now, I'm going to invite Ethan. Ethan, are you there? Um, I'm going to invite him to read for us Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30 from the ESV. So as Ethan reads, um, let us just pay close attention to what Jesus is trying to say to us in this passage. So uh, yeah, Ethan can just unmute yourself and read for us while I take a little break. Okay. Um, the parable of the talents, Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to, to each according to his ability. Then when he went away, then he went away, sorry. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also had the two talents came and he also who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, 
you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew what you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away, and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Thank you so much, Ethan. Now this is a passage where Jesus is actually talking about money. Okay, so the word talent that is translated in the ESV, uh, if you found find it in your your NIV Bible, is the word gold. So that's what a talent is. Okay, in this parable. Well, the the parable refers to talent when actually it refers to gold. Okay, what it's actually essentially referring to is gold. But while Jesus is actually talking about money, I believe the principles that are actually found in this passage can also be applicable to the various talents that we have as well. Right? Money is a resource that is given uh, by God to us, but our talents are also a resource that God has given to us. Now, the question is, oops, okay, who are you in this parable? Right? Some of you would identify yourself as the one that has the five talents. Maybe you have a talent in music, uh, you're also pretty talented in your studies, doing well in school. You're in a good school. And in your school, uh, furthermore, you are a leader in your CCA, in your class. Or, you know, you're pretty talented as compared to others. Uh, you see, you, you're probably more talented than the average person. But you have like, you're the, like the one with five talents. That's some of you here. Right? But maybe um, some of you might identify yourself as with the one that has two talents, okay, pretty average, uh, maybe not as talented as people, but you're good as, at two or three different things. You may not have a talent in music, uh, but you may have a talent in sports, in frisbee or football, okay, for example, or maybe you have a talent in photography, okay, using the camera. So that's some of you here. But maybe some of you here might actually identify yourself with the one, with only one talent. And that's, and, and that's you feeling pretty small about yourself. Or if there's another character in this parable with zero talents, you, you'll probably say, oh, that's, that's me, okay? Other people are talented, but not me. I'm just good at eating or sleeping. And, and that's the typical answer that I get from a lot of my ex-students okay, when I ask them, what's your hobby? Oh, eating, sleeping. Uh, I'm good at only sleeping. But I'm not sure if that's you, if you, if you think of yourself like that, right? No talents, uh, only talent is sleeping or eating. You don't see yourself good at anything. Right? So we are, we are, we are one of these uh, characters in this parable. I'd like to just reveal to us that shocking twist that is found. Okay, this is a shocking twist in this parable. What happens to the three people? Right, to put it bluntly, the, the, the one, the servant with that one talent, in the blunt, bluntest manner, he eventually ends up in hell. He ends up in hell. Right, that's what the last two verses say. For to everyone who has, will more be given. He will have an abundance. But the one who has not, 
even what he has will be taken away. Cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's a picture of hell, right? That's Verse 30 is that picture of hell. How did it happen that one, the guy with one talent, eventually ends up with zero talents, everything taken away from him? And, and if you read verse 30, it seems that he's not even a Christian to begin with. That's the shocking twist in the whole parable. But I wonder what you think. Like the first time when I read it, I thought, wow, this is so unfair. Right, the, the guy with five talents gets more added to him and the guy who has only one talent is casted out from the master's presence. What's going on here? Well, if you read the parable again carefully, you'll realize that the main issue, okay, it's not with the number of talents in this passage. The main issue is not with the number of talents at all. Five or two or one talent, that's not the main issue. Okay? The main issue is about the use of the talents given, not the number of talents that is given. And follow me, i like to give us one very good reason why the person with just one talent had that one talent taken away from him and was eventually cast out of the master's presence and punished. Okay? This is how the parable of the talent Begins. For the kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. The one he gave five talents to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. And then he ran away. Right now, I believe the reason why the person with one talent was eventually punished, it was because that one talent was entrusted to him. In other words, that talent didn't even belong to him in the first place. It belonged to his master. His master had caught him. The, his master had entrusted him. Right? The talent was the master's property, not his. And it was merely entrusted, like these keys that you see here, into the hands of of the servant. And that's the first of the three points I'd like to make about our talents. Right? Talent is not what you have, but what you are entrusted with. Talent is not what you have, but what you have been entrusted with by God. The talents that we have are given to us by God. It doesn't belong to us in the first place. So whether you have a talent in music or in studies or in organizing stuff or simply being friendly to people, it doesn't come or originate from you. But if it first belongs to God, it's entrusted to you by God. You know, as created beings, none of us can actually claim that something originates from us. Right? We're created by God. All that we have is given to us by God. We can't say that the talent is mine. It's given originally from God. Right? God is the one, the, that master that had entrusted those talents into our hands. And it says to each according to his ability. Some of us are given more talents, five by the one with five. Some are given less. But to each according to his ability. What is constant right, is that everyone is entrusted at least one talent from the master. Right, so no one here can actually say, I have no talents. But if you are created in the image of God, God has created you to be talented in something. Right, it's more of an excuse than a fact that you have no talents. Okay, God has created you with talents. It's a matter of how much, whether you have more or less talents. But He has definitely given you talents in your life. And now I'm going to go to a second point about what talent is. And that is that talent is not meant to be self-glorifying, but God and others serving. Okay, that's, that's what talent is for. Talent is not meant to be self-glorifying, but God and others serving. 
So if you if you read verses 16 and 17, look at what the guy with five talents did. Right? He used it responsibly. Right? He, he went to use the five talents to make another five talents for his master. Similarly, for the guy who had two talents, right? he used that two re talents responsibly also for the master. I believe these two verses alone give us the principle of what talents ought to be. Right? Talents, are ought, talents ought to be used for God's glory. Right? It's not meant for self-glorification. It's meant for God-glorification. It's meant for, to be used for others. As First Peter 4.10 says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received from God right, to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace. God is the one who has entrusted talents to us. Not so that we can flaunt our talents to draw attention to ourselves, to boost our own egos, to feel good about ourselves, to use our talents for our own selfish benefits. But God has entrusted talents to us so that we can use them to serve Him, so that we can use them to serve others. And back to Wakanda. Right? Vibranium is given to Wakanda, not so that Wakanda can thrive and become the most powerful nation on earth, while the rest of the world descends into chaos. But Vibranium is given to Wakanda so that Wakanda can use it for the benefit of the whole world. And similarly, for the talents that God has given us, they are to be used for the sake of others, for the sake of God's glory. That's the right use of talents. Talents, is not, talents are not meant to be self-glorifying, but God and others serving. And so on National Day today, I think it's timely that all of us do an honest stock take of the talents that God has actually given us. Right, what are some of the talents that God has given you in your life? Do not belittle any of them. Right, and the next question we probably want to ask is also this. Have we been using our God-given talents for the wrong purposes, for our own enjoyment, for our own benefits, to boost our own egos? Or have we been using our God-given talents, whatever it may be, okay, a sport, a musical talent, a skill, or even a positive personality trait, even humor, have it be using it for God's glory? Right? Vibranium is meant to bless the outside world, not hidden within Wakanda. Your talent is meant to bless others for God's glory, not to be used for self. And with the great blessings you are given comes that great responsibility to steward it well. Finally, let's examine the guy with one talent who eventually lost it, right? And that guy illustrates to us this final point that talent is not meant to be hidden but to be used responsibly. Okay? Talent is not meant to be hidden but to be used responsibly. Now, the guy that was given one talent what he did was to hide his talent, like Wakanda did. He did nothing useful with it. He buried it in the ground, and then he returned that talent to his master. Now, once again, I'm going to emphasize, the issue here is not how much talent was given, right? but rather the issue here is about how the talent that was given is used. So if you notice, both the one with five talents and the one with two talents, right? when they steward that those talents well. They receive the same praise and the same reward from their master. The master says to them, well done, good and faithful servant. Same praise, same reward. Compare verse 21 and verse 23. Exactly the same. Doesn't matter if you have five or two, right? Same, same praise, same reward. And I'm pretty sure that if the guy with one talent had did the same and used that one talent well, he will receive the same praise and the same reward as the one with five and two. Right? But the guy did not receive the same praise and same reward, not because he has fewer talents, he had just one talent, but the issue was because he wasn't using that one talent responsibly for God. So similarly, if, if the one 
where five or two talents they did not use their talents responsibly, I believe the same punishment, the same consequence would have befallen them. Okay, as the one with the one talent who wasted it away. So it really doesn't matter how much talent you are given. But what really matters is how we are using it. Whether you have five, two, or one, or half a talent. What really matters is how we are using our talent for God's glory. But are we burying our talent underground? Are we hiding our talent so that no one can benefit from it? Are we simply wasting our talents away? What, however much you have, however much or how little talents you have that God has given you. Right, the master called the one who had wasted the one talent away a wicked and slothful servant. For he was slothful or lazy because that servant did not make good use of the talent that he was given. He rather not do anything about it. Right, but why is he wicked? Why, why the term wicked? Well, he's wicked because that talent doesn't belong to him. It belonged to his master. But it, it wasn't his to begin with. And he was doing something, he was, he was not doing something, he was misusing whatever the master was given, has given to him. He was misusing his master's property. Right, that's akin to actually misusing funds belonging to the company. Right, the funds doesn't belong to you, it belongs to the company, and you're misusing it, you're not using it well. That's akin as well to, say, misusing the car that your master has passed you to drive and go buy groceries with it. Right? You, go, you go into a car accident and you misuse the car, you crash the car. That's misusing it. Right? Because that's the master's property. It's not our property. And so that's a wicked and slothful servant which the master casted out from his presence into the outer darkness. Because this person was not qualified to be a servant of the master. He was no servant at all. And that's the point that Francis Chan is trying to make uh, from his book, Letters to the Church. Let me just read this quote for all of us. Let's pay attention to it. Francis Chan says, he writes, don't you see the weirdness of in calling people Christian, Christian, right? When they aren't servants. I know we can't force people to serve, but there's, there has to be something we can do. No team puts up with players who refuse to contribute. No army puts up with soldiers who don't carry their own weight. Why do churches continue to put up with Christians who refuse to serve? Why don't we treat selfishness as a sin that needs to be confronted? If scripture commands us to serve one another, isn't it a bit strange that we give people a free pass? In other words, Christians who don't serve God with the talents, it's like that, that slave, with, that servant with one talent, who's not a servant at all. But they're not Christians at all, according to the term of what Christian means. A Christian is a servant of Jesus Christ. Pretty harsh words, but, and, and this is a very scary passage. Right, but I believe in a similar fashion, one day, okay, all of us here listening to this will have to give an account to, Lord, to our Lord Jesus Christ himself. How have we been using the talents that God has given to us? And that's, that's a pretty scary thing. Right? God will be asking us, how have we been using the talents that he has given us? And we will either be the, the five the one with five talents, two talents, or the one with one talent that was cast out from the master's presence. Right. Have we been using our talents responsibly for God's glory, for the benefit of others? Or have we been hiding our talents for ourselves and using it for self-glorification? And that's the question that God confronted me a couple of years ago. Right. God asked me the question, what was I doing with basketball? Okay, was I using basketball for my glory to boost my pride? Or was I using basketball for his glory? And so five years ago, uh, I was led to have a really interesting experience of coaching and managing a pro-am basketball team here in Singapore with players from 11 different nationalities. So we had players from China, 
from Vietnam, from Philippines, from the US, from the UK, from the Australia, from Serbia, from Lebanon, and they come from all walks of life. Okay, I had a business executive in my team, I had a waiter in my team. Right? And, and this experience was kind of being placed into 11 different mission fields okay, at one time. And, and during my time with this team, I didn't, I didn't think too much. Well, I just felt that okay, it's basketball. Um, but I felt this calling that God has placed me okay, in this team to simply be that Christian presence okay, to the team. Like a Christian, being a Christian presence to the team. Using basketball, but being a Christian presence. Right? And just last year, God surprised me okay, when I just reconnected with one of my teammate from China. Okay, we were having a meal together and we know each other for about five years now. And then he just dropped a question to me and he said, uh, I think I want to go to church. And I was totally shocked by what he said. Right? And, and that's the point when I saw how even basketball, it can be used for God's glory. It doesn't need to be used for self-glorification. It doesn't need to be to be a talent that, you know, just for recreation. But it can be used for others. It can be used to bring people to Christ for God's glory. And another question that God asked me many years ago was, what was I doing with my love for music? By all those Yamaha classes that my mother sent me since I was four years old. What was that for, right? Uh, and so, with that, God led me to join a choir. So I joined a choir for a couple of years. And this was a choir who sang to raise funds for missions okay, in Singapore and overseas. And later, uh, similarly, with, tal with, with that talent in music, um, I was led to join the worship team back in my ex-church to be a vocalist and later to be a worship leader. And because I had the opportunity to do that, uh, to use that to glorify God, God gave me the opportunity to meet my wife, right? We led worship together at a freshman camp. So that's my wife beside me in the picture. So God opened doors when I was serving Him, when I was stewarding that, res that talent responsibly. With great blessings come great responsibilities. But talent is not what we have, but what we have been entrusted with. Talent is not meant to be self-glorifying, but God and others serving. And finally, talent is not meant to be hidden, but to be used responsibly. So my question to all of us is, how are we using the talents that God has blessed us with today to serve Him and to serve others for His glory? I'm going to end by getting Daniel to play for us the last end credit scenes of Black Panther. This is Black Panther speaking to the UN about a new Wakanda. Okay, what Wakanda is going to do, uh, it's going to open up and it's going to use vibranium to reach the outside world. Now bear with the African accent, okay, but may this could be a picture of a new Wakanda in your life and in our church. Daniel, please. All right, I'm done. Uh, I'm going to invite Alistair to lead us in the closing song. All right. Can you hear me? All righty. Okay, our last song um, we're going to be doing is called Alabaster Jar. Should be pretty familiar with all right. Sorry, wait. <laughs> I can't remember how the song goes. Uh, I don't know
All right, all right, all right. Sorry, give me a sec. The key is just really different. in our hearts. I want to lead us in a prayer along two lines. The first is along the lines of us being a church with the gospel. How have we been going out and reaching out to others who desperately need it? 
Okay, I also want to pray along the lines of each of us, each youth here, having the talent, being blessed with talents that God has given us. How have we been using them? How have we been stewarding our talents for the sake of others and for His glory? But let's take some moment to just with God. What is something that God has blessed you with? What is one talent, a couple of talents that God has blessed you with that you are hiding? Or perhaps you're using the talents wrongly. You're using it for self-glorification, for self-enjoyment, but not for His glory. May God lead you to examine what you've been doing with it and to steward it right, that talent right, for His glory. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, you are our creator. You've created each and every one for your purpose and for your glory with different talents, each according to our own ability, uniquely created by you. You have blessed each and every youth here with a talent, whether it's big or small, whether it's many of you. And Lord, it's my prayer We you convict each and every one to live for your glory, to use that talent to benefit and to to go out into a world that desperately needs you. Compel us to go out with the gospel, especially in these days, Lord. So many people need the gospel outside of the church. Lead us to go into different fields that you have placed us in, in our schools, in our CCAs, even in our neighborhoods to give the precious gift of the gospel that you have given to us, to use the resources that you have given to us for the benefit of those who need it, to change us, oh God. Help us look beyond ourselves. Help us look at your mission and the purpose that you have created us, each and every one of us, for our lives. And now you receive God's benediction. May the Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the talents that He's created you with, enable you, empower you, and compel you to use that talent or those talents for His glory, for the benefit of others. In His name I pray. Amen. Amen. Service is now over and happy National Day to everyone. I hope each of you enjoy the rest of uh, National Day weekend and God bless all of you. Take care and goodbye. Bye -bye.